If you will, take your Bible and look with me in Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Last time we saw how these majority of these spies brought an evil report with regard to what God had promised concerning the land that he had purposed to bring them into. In other words, they perverted the word of God. They perverted his gospel. That's what an evil report is, taking the things that God calls good and calling evil and taking what God says is evil and calling it good. But I want us to consider today the testimony of Joshua and Caleb, two men who went in with these 12 spies. And in the face of unbelief of these others, stood for the truth. And so this title could be for this message, either facing unbelief, as I put in the bulletin, or it could be standing alone. Standing alone. What is characteristic of Joshua and Caleb is going to be needful in our day. I'll just tell you that straight up. This unbelieving generation of Israel is very typical of so-called Christianity today. For some time, the message of the gospel has been perverted. It didn't just start recently. Of course, it goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. Well, actually, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where the serpent questioned Eve and said, Yea, hath God said? Right there is where false doctrine began. Right there is where the seeds of unbelief were sown by Satan himself, the father of all liars. And that's really what we're dealing with, the difference between a lie and a truth. Some people like to make, you know, kind of take the edge off a little bit and say, well, you know, we're all somewhere. Now, it's either truth or error. It's either light or darkness. And uh, that's certainly how Joshua and Caleb set it forth here. In verse 6, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land. So this is amazing. I mean, they all went in. <laughs> together and yet they come out with two different reports but they understood the seriousness of it because it says here they rent their clothes when was the last time you were so upset that you literally tore your clothes this is a a serious matter in their mind and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel I've tried to picture how this would be this gathering, but you know, there, you can imagine the tumult and, and just murmurings and people. It's one thing to stand and declare the truth before people that love to hear what you have to say. It's another to stand up and have to declare it to people that are upset at you and ready to take your life. And I wonder in those situations how we would go silent. Would we? Would we not be faithful? To to the Lord and to his word. These were, they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we pass through to search it. You know, they're not just trying to come in carefully on this thing. They nail it the way it is. It is an exceeding good land. <laughs> this is all the while while these others are saying, no, it's not. No, it's not. What are they stating? The word of God. They are declaring what they all knew to be so, especially when you look back in Numbers 13, 27, where it says, and they told him and said, this is where they gave the report to Moses and Aaron, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. It's interesting that they stated the truth, and yet you see that verse 28, nevertheless. Yay, nay, preaching. Here's what we know, but that's how a lie is told. Yeah, yea, hath God said, okay, I understand he said this, but 
Anytime you start undoing the word of God, but we see Joshua and Caleb coming uh, and boldly declaring, no, the land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land, period. God's made it so. And then they said, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. You see, their confidence wasn't in themselves or in their own strength. It was in the Lord. What he purposed, what he promised. A land which floweth with milk and honey. And then they declared this challenge to that people. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Now you can call it what you want to. Fear and all these things. But really the, the bottom line is rebellion. Neither fear ye the people of the land. For they are bread for us. Let's quit talking about them eating us. They're, they're our bread. For uh, their defense is departed from them. You say, well, how could they say that when it's said that they dwelt in cities that are walled? Well, those walled cities are nothing before a holy God and a sovereign God. We saw that when Joshua went in. He took the people and they marched around that city of Jericho seven times without even firing a shot. The whole thing fell. And not the Lord able. That was their declaration here. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. <laughs> but you can see the response here in verse 10. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. So I think sometimes we think that cloud was a little, you can see it in pictures, just kind of a straight up column. But I imagine it to be, I mean, we're talking about a thing that had to be seen by two million people. It was so large that back in, and when they were, remember when they were in Egypt, the, the darkness was so heavy on the Egyptian side, but light on the, on the side of the Israelites. I've seen some of these uh, pictures of these hurricanes from above and seeing just the, the majesty of some of those clouds in there. And I thought, you know, the story's not even half been told with regard to what this cloud must have represented. I, I can imagine these people seeing that cloud move. The Lord's about to, to deal with this matter. And we need to be aware. But this is the message that I have to tell you today is about this matter of standing alone. And I believe it's very pertinent. How easy it is for many just to go with the flow and not create a stir, hope things get better, not have any serious commitment to the truth or to the gospel or even sacrifice or a willingness to stand alone if necessary. I believe this is one of the most difficult things for any of us is to stand alone. We might not even face any persecution. I, now, I don't know if anybody is ready to take stones and kill me, but it takes the grace of God to be able to stand alone in the face of the direction that so-called Christianity is going. It's the differences between night and day. They call it Christianity, but it's so far from what the Scripture describes as Christianity. And where did it begin? Well, it began with someone telling a lie. Someone told a lie on, on God saying he loved everybody. And someone believed it. And it's been perpetuated all the way down. I, I don't, you can take, just pick, randomly pick most of these congregations that are in this city. Just go in and ask the pastor, does God love every single person? They would look at you, I mean, they'd be funny. They'd look at you funny and say, why are you even asking? Of course. The same thing, God, if someone started a lie at one time saying Christ died for everybody. And that is believed. When I drive down the road and see now this big old banner, you know, promoting Franklin Graham coming into, into town. You know, where are those that are concerned about men's souls, about what he's going to be telling them at the center town? Are there any? You know, are we bold enough to stand up and say the man is a false prophet and declare him to be so? He is. He's going to come in and tell people that if you want hope of salvation, here's what God has done, but here's what you need to do. And he's going to have people walking an aisle, raising their hand, and he's going to be condemning their souls all the more to hell unless God intervenes.
That's just the truth. But where are those today that they're willing to stand up and declare it so? It's just this namby pamby well, you know, we got to be careful what we say here, not when it involves the very glory of Christ. You know, deception can be so subtle, especially when everybody else seems undisturbed in the face of evil or danger. Isn't it? You know, I thought about this. I was talking yesterday over in Ruston. We went over to a parents' day over there for my son's the school at Tech, but I sat next to a former Enron employee. This is the first one I've ever talked to face to face. I've seen it in the news of somebody that was actually affected, and he was one of their he was one of their accountants. And as I sat at the table, he told me. I, I asked him. I said, "Didn't weren't there warnings?" And he said, there were warnings. He said, I cannot sit here and tell you there weren't warnings. And he said, I've got my MBA. He said, I got my master's in business education. I should have known better. But he said, when I looked around, everybody else seemed unperturbed. But he said, the figures kept saying, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. And he said, I just, I went right into the, the slaughterhouse with everybody else. Believing promises. Hey, when it was all coming apart, they hit a man saying, he said, now I know this stock is only worth 60, but it's selling at 90, but hang on, don't sell. It'll be worth 120 before you know it. And he said, before it was all said and done, he said that when he finally checked into it, it was down to $10, and by the time he tried to do anything with it, it was zero, zero. And that was his pension. He was up in years, and he's working today, trying to make ends meet, affected. I thought of the same thing, Twin Towers. I remember listening to some of the testimonies of people that did survive, but they said, you know, they stood there and watched that other tower collapse, and they were in the building that they were in, and there was a loudspeaker telling them, don't, just stay where you are. It's going to be okay. Stay where you are. And they looked around, and no one else seemed to be perturbed, so they stood there. And the next thing you know, the building's coming down. But you know, if these things with regard to men's lives are so, even more vital, our need for discernment. Let's do not weigh true and false based upon what others say about it. We need to weigh truth and error based upon what this word right here has to say. How vital it is to weigh everything. This is our standard right here, the word of God. And how vital because it pertains to God's glory. Better to hear the voice of God than to listen to the voice of men. The Word of God, do you suppose it's directives? I know we take these things lightly when we read the commands of Scripture, we read the promises of Scripture. But I'm telling you, every one of them is vital. Every one of them to our souls. To heed what He has to say. And yet people out of lust and greed, fear, rebellion, refuse to hear. And what do they do? They ultimately forfeit rest and peace and some eternal condemnation. That's what awaits them unless the Lord is pleased to intervene. But I thank God that there are those who like the example here of Joshua and Caleb. I love to read these examples. Ones that are chosen, redeemed, called. And they're kept by God's grace. You, you say, why Joshua and Caleb? Why were they any different than the others of their generation? Well, the only thing I can say is what was said of Noah. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That, <laughs> that's the only thing I know. Uh, you know, and I, I, I love that reading that you read, Brother Jim, there about the blind man. They were trying to get some sort of big theological statement out of him and drag him in and he said, all I know is I was blind, now I see. <laughs> That's what made the difference. Now, the Lord didn't leave him there. He continued to teach him, but it's the grace of God. That's distinguishing grace. He said, I marvel that you don't know it. That's, he was saying these to these leaders. He, when he when he read that, I underscored There's distinctive grace, but I, I know mine I see. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. That's the, That's the grace of God but how we need it, dear friends, today. And I'm talking about us right here, because when we walk out that door, everything we know and understand about God as he set forth in this word, this world stands in opposition to. They don't see him as sovereign. They don't see themselves as, as totally depraved. 
they don't see Christ's death as the as, as salvation. They don't see it. And I'm talking about even in churches where grace of God is proclaimed. They see it as some sort of down payment, some, some aspect of salvation, but then you'll hear people say, well, there's all these other elements too. <laughs> Just let's all mix it up and make one big vegetable stew out of it. Now, I'm telling you that if God has saved any sinner, he's done it on the basis of the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and his imputed righteousness alone, not anything in us. That's where we need to stand in this day. And it's not easy when you see people following the crowd. You know, in the flesh, which would you prefer? To have everybody go along together or stand alone? I'll tell you. Most people's minds, following the crowd is the way to go. But we're called to stand alone. And it's going to be so in, in our day, just as it was with Joshua and Caleb. I believe when you find someone with that persuasion, being unmoved in the face of opposition, there's one that's truly been taught of God. But what set them apart? Well, let me just give you some characteristics that I see here in scripture this matter of standing alone what sets one of the lords apart well first of all i believe a sense of urgency about god's glory in the face of unbelief i love to have a good time i love to talk to people about different subjects and you know we can get into you know some very amicable discussions but when it comes down to matters pertaining to salvation pertaining to the glory of god pertain to what he says in this word. You know, some people have told me before, have you ever seen the look on your face? <laughs> I can't, I can't see it. But there is a, there is something when the Lord has taught you with regard to the purpose of God and his, and his will and the Son of God and his glory and salvation, that when people begin to meddle with that truth, it's serious. And that's the time just to put the hand up and say, now wait a minute. Let's get back to what is real. Let's get back to the Word. Let's get back to talking about what this Word says. There's no room for trifling or compromise in this area. This sign of, you know, I've never physically rent my clothes. <laughs> I've felt like it sometimes. But renting the clothes is a sign of sorrow, true sorrow. I've seen it in Africa where when they've learned word that someone has passed away. I've seen people just literally strip their clothes off, go naked, just roll in the dust. And, you know, there are some who are expected to, so it's just kind of a performance. But there's others when, I mean, that is true sorrow. They'll sit that way for two or three days. There's no consoling them. No consoling them. It's also a sign of blasphemy. You remember on the opposite side, when Christ declared himself to be the Son of God, it says that the high priest rent his clothes. That was a symbolic way of declaring his opposition to who Christ was. If you look over in Acts chapter 14, look in Acts chapter 14, when Paul and Barnabas were preaching and they had healed this one lame man at Lystra, they hadn't, but the Lord had, had done it through them. Verse 10, it's the, he said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lycaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. So they were approaching these men like gods and according to their minds. But look in verse 14, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? Just the very thought of taking any kind of honor to themselves. I know a lot of men today that stand in the pulpit that love this honor. They love to be seen as gods before men, but not so with the Lord's servant. He said, we also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, 
which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. And then they go on and, and continue to preach. But the rending of the clothes is a symbol of, you know, blasphemy. And that's exactly how Joshua and Caleb saw this. There was a sense of urgency about God's glory. You know, I suppose we would react that way if someone said something, I would, about my wife that put her down and, and in any way belittled her. My children, you'd stand up in a hurry in their defense. But even more so here, the, the very glory of God. They had here what one writer called a holy indignation at the sin of the people and a holy dread of the wrath of God. They saw what these people could not see because they were blind. And therefore they were moved to this sort of response. You know, again, God-given faith. It's a grace that does not allow us to remain indifferent in the face of unbelief, either in others or ourselves. And certainly, I believe that's what caused them to stand apart. Secondly, I believe what we see here is a willingness to stand before those who oppose themselves and tell the truth, even though a minority. <laughs> you know, most people judge truth based upon a majority vote. Well, if, you know, if the majority believe it, it must be so, not so. You notice here in verse 7, this wasn't just something where they rent their clothes and ran off. <laughs> they made the statement, and then in verse 7, it says, they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel. I believe there's a relationship that we're going to find in Scripture between being taught of the Spirit of God by His grace and speaking the truth. Now, we speak it in love, speak the truth. If you look over in Acts chapter 4, Look in Acts chapter 4 and verse 29. You say, where did they get this boldness? Well, it, it certainly wasn't in them. I'm sure afterward, they probably, in their own flesh, probably quaked, thinking, you know, they were about ready to stone us. So where did this boldness come from? Well, here in, in Acts chapter 4, you see this prayer back in the beginning of the early church when Peter and, and John were brought before the council and then released. Uh, they tried to put fear into Peter and John to get them to be quiet, not to preach in Christ's name. But you notice how the people gathered here prayed. It says in verse 24, And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. They were praying the scriptures. This is Psalm 2. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So there is a strong persuasion here that even in this, God was directing. And then they said, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Here it is. And grant unto thy servants... Silence? No. <laughs> Grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. That's the time to be clear. That's the time to be plain when men are opposing it the most. When men make statements that are contrary to the truth as it is in Christ, that's the time to speak up. And that's certainly what we need to pray for. But such boldness is the effect of the work of the Spirit of grace. But it's also the effect of God-given persuasion, conviction as to who God is and what he's promised. Bill was reading this in our men's time just before our first service today over in Hebrews chapter 13. And verse 6, you know, we have this promise that God will never leave us nor forsake us. 
And then in verse six, it says, so that we may what? Boldly say, <laughs> boldly. No reason to cower, no reason to back off, even in the face of opposition, that we may boldly say what? The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I wonder how strongly we believe the truth of God's free grace in Christ. You know, we live in a world that is completely opposed to it. And somewhere, they, everybody talking about grace, but they've got some mixture of man's works in it. Whether it has to do with our forgiveness, whether it has to do with our justification, whether it has to do with our sanctification. I wonder where are those that are willing to boldly stand and say, no, he was made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and let him that glorieth glory in the Lord. That's the, the bottom line. But thirdly, I would say this, coming back to our text, what made Joshua and Caleb stand apart was a strong belief in the goodness and faithfulness of God to do for his own all that he had promised. Do we have that sort of persuasion? A strong belief in what? The goodness and faithfulness of God. Now, if anything depends upon me, then certainly there's no hope, but based on who God is, will he not do what he says he will do? I'm talking now about just little things with regard to our lives that we fret over, that we think, well, it's too strong for me. Yes, it is, but not for God, not for God. Is he not able to do for his own all that he's promised? And that's really what Joshua and Caleb testified here in verses 7 and 8 in this portion of Scripture. The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. You know, faith doesn't see the obstacles. If God gives you faith, you're not looking at the walled cities. You're not looking at the giants. You're seeing God. On what do those walls depend? God. Can any man by worry add to his stature? Every one of us is what we are by what God has purposed. And so we rest in that. And only the blindness of the heart will keep someone from seeing the goodness of the Lord, even above the adversities of life or heart. And I'm not trying to put on a face here and tell you that I don't struggle. I do. But I'm telling you this. Either God is who he says he is or he's not. <laughs> we either believe him or we don't. We either rest in what he has said concerning salvation and leave our hands out of it, you know, or we continue to, to go the way of the world and, and ultimately, unless the Lord turns us around, face eternal condemnation. Because that's just how serious it is a matter to God. He's not going to give his glory to another. They said in, in verse 8, if the Lord delight in us. There's not presumption there. There is a resting. You say, what is this all based on then? Where's the hope? If the Lord delight in us. <laughs> That's where it is. If he doesn't, nothing you do is going to change it. But if he delight in us, nothing that men do is going to change it. <laughs> if he delight in us. I love that word delight. You know, I started, I took the time in the concordance to go and look up that word delight. You realize in most cases, the delighting in scripture pertains to the son, the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> in whom he delights. You look that word up. There's very few references in Scripture where it directly refers to the Lord delighting in any sinner. You say, well, how could he? He's a holy God. Well, the answer is only in his Son. If the Lord delighted in us, it's because he's purposed to save us by his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm sure that this is where Joshua and Caleb's confidence was. It wasn't anything in them. Just like Abel, just like any of those Old Testament saints, they looked to the day in which God would put his son to death on their behalf. Those sacrifices and offerings that they offered were all forward-looking to that time. That's where they knew the delight of God was, was in his son, in that death that he would accomplish on their behalf. And they saw even this entering into the land as part of the fulfillment of that whole history of redemption that was taking place. That's why they said onward, forward. <laughs> Maybe they didn't see it as plainly as what we're able to see it today, but they had that God-given persuasion that this is all about someone other than ourselves. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And over in Romans chapter 8, if you look in Romans 8, this is the parallel here. 
If the Lord delight in us, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. That speaks of all the graces of God in Christ. Oh, if the Lord delight in us, it's because of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he accomplished. You see in verse 31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? <laughs> and you notice how that's how they, they led into this. They were saying that they are bred for us. You know, if God be for us, then what are these men? They're but grasshoppers. Their defense has departed from them. But how is it that God can be for us? Well, look at verse 32. He that spared not his own son. How can he delight in us? Well, he spared not his own son. There had to be a just dealing with my sin before God for him to delight in me. But it says he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What is my forgiveness based upon? My believing? No, on Christ dying. What is my justification based upon? My believing? No, Christ dying. What is my reconciliation with God founded upon? My believing? No, Christ dying. I believe because he died for me. That's just the way the scripture set it forward. If he died for me, if he's delighted in me, then he's given me this faith to look. And if he hasn't yet, he will. All that Christ has died for in time, he's going to cause to see the very same thing that Joshua and Caleb saw and learn of what it is to have God delight in you. The only way God can delight in any sinner is by a just satisfaction of his holy character. And that Christ did. That Christ did. Well, here's another fourth thing that I believe made them stand out, and that was a fear of God that is greater than men. You see in verse 9, they said, Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. Fear of God that is greater than man. You know, you look at a lion and you think, wow, what an opponent. <laughs> but what is a lion in the face of its maker? The lion is nothing. The Lord can take that breath away just as easily as he gave it. We tend to forget, we become atheists many times in the face of, of opposition. We look at it and think, we start conniving and figuring out how we're going to work this thing out. What we ought to do is fall flat on our face before God and say, with me, this is impossible, but with you, all things are are possible. And whatever was suggested to the contrary, they saw here by faith. Again, this is God-given faith. They saw that the advantage was with the Lord. <laughs> oh, what a, what a blessing that is. They said their defenses departed from them. When God removes his hand of restraint from an enemy, I'll tell you, they'll fall just like a, a dead person. There's nothing to keep them up. And, you know, you think about this, even though Israel dwelt in tents at this time, I mean, I'm sure that's what they're looking at. Here we are in tents, and there they are in walled cities. But even though Israel dwelt in tents, they were actually more fortified than those who lived in their walled cities. Why? Because God was their refuge. But let's don't ever put confidence in a bank account. Let's don't ever put confidence in our health. Let's don't ever put confidence in things that we hope to have. Our confidence has to be in the Lord. Better the fear of God than the fear of men. And then the final thing I'd bring out here in verse 10 is that we see here what distinguished them was the grace to stand for the glory of Christ even when threatened with their very lives. It may come to that, but here in verse 10 it says all the congregation bade stone them with stones. I, I'm sure that while they were speaking <laughs> they could see people gathering these stones or they, were, they could hear the cries starting to go up. But it didn't stop them. It didn't deter them. And I'll tell you, they identified unbelief for what it is, rebellion. They said, only rebel not ye against the Lord. You know, if God gives men over to their own hardness and indifference, he's just in doing so. But the hardness of men's hearts is often manifest in desiring to kill the messenger rather than bow to the one who's raised them up. We saw that in our Bible class, didn't we? Brother David dealt with it there when, uh, in Matthew 23, when the vineyard master sent his servants there. It says they took stones to stone them. 
We're seeing right here already, early did Israel begin to misuse the prophets. I'll tell you, there's people today, that you can mark it down, they would rather see you dead than to hear you glorify Christ and give him all the glory. Just be ready for it. There's some that'll pray for it. They hope the day will come when they open the newspaper and find your picture in there. They can say, aha, <laughs> in the obituary, aha. But I'll tell you this, if the Lord be for you, who can be against you? I wonder, where are the Joshua's and the Caleb's today? I just, I wonder, what about here? Will we just blindly float along following men in their rebellion against the true rest procured by Christ and promised in his death? That's what the scripture says for. That's what Canaan is all about. It has to do with the rest that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we going to follow men who rather than preach the person of Christ and his finished work at Calvary prefer to to use open-ended statements trying to pacify people. I, I hear people coming close. I hear a lot of preachers. When I've questioned them, they'll say, well, you know, I, I tend to believe like you do, but, you know, if I try to be too plain, then I've, I've got to worry about upheaval. <laughs> well, I'm telling you what, better the upheaval. Better people know the truth than to have men think that somehow they have something to do with their, their salvation or attributing somehow a righteousness to themselves that, that is apart from the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm convinced more and more than our day, this matter of the imputed righteousness of Christ is the issue. How is it that God looks upon? Is it by any inner righteousness or is it by a worked out righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ put to my account? I'm telling you this, I believe the scriptures state it's by the worked out imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ in the death of Christ. That's how I'm declared righteous. And that alone. And I, by God's grace, will go to my death looking to that righteousness alone. Not in here, but to his righteousness alone. And that's going to take courage to stand for it. Because I'm telling you, there's a mixed message being preached today that's just as lethal as what Joshua and Caleb faced in their day. We'll not enter into that rest. <laughs> People are saying, we'll not enter into that imputed righteousness rest. We believe it's imputed, but we also believe, and, and there's that but. We also believe you need to have a righteousness. You need to have in you some righteousness that gives you some other standing before God other than what Christ established. That's a very dangerous teaching, dear friends, and one that needs to be denounced. I'll tell you, it keeps people from entering into the procured and promised rest of God's people, a rest of a satisfied God. When was my case satisfied before a holy God it was satisfied in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and I'll tell you any other message keeps people in ignorance and, and blindness and darkness well I pray the Lord give us courage to stand alone if need be I'm thankful for I notice here the Lord although you stand alone he always gives you comfort and there was Joshua and there was Caleb <laughs> not many but there there were those sheep that he caused to stand. I pray he'll give us that, that same grace. Gracious Father, I do thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity to hear it. I pray that you would grant us your blessing to know nothing but Christ and him crucified and enter into that rest that you have purpose for your people in him. Be with us through this week and constantly turn our hearts and minds to your blessed son, I pray. We give you the praise in his precious name. Amen.